My name is Douglas Gill. I'm a professor emeritus now at the University of uh, Maryland and uh, have given quite a number of talks uh, on my work on pink lady slipper orchids, a 45 year study on pink lady slipper orchids. And I've also been the scientific director of a, a grassland restoration project out on the Eastern shore. But one of the great joys of my life is to be a colleague of Melissa McCormick, Dr. Melissa McCormick, who will be the speaker this evening. And uh, Melissa uh, got her bachelor's degree from Trinity University in San Antonio, uh, Texas, and her PhD from Michigan State University in the Department of Ecology, evolution, and behavior. Is that right? Ecology, evolutionary biology, and behavior. And bi biology. Okay. <laughs> um, and since 1999, has been an uh, uh, ecologist, <laughs> okay, at the Smithsonian Environmental Research uh, Center over in Edgewater. Uh, so, yes, uh, she's been a very active researcher in all manner of botany and conservation, but with a specialty on orchids and the nature of and the interaction of their mycorrhizal fungi. And she has been the found, one of the founding members, perhaps the founding members of the North American uh, Orchid Conservation Center that, that's uh, centered at uh, CERC. Uh, she's done extensive research uh, all over the world, including islands in the West Pacific Ocean, Palau, I think, in particular, uh, as well as here. And I've had a, a delightful association with her for now many years with the orchids that have been found on some of my, uh, particularly the grassland restoration project out on the uh, Eastern shore, uh, where we found a new spiranthes uh, just last, <laughs> last year. Uh, so tonight she is going to talk about the, her main focus of work on orchids, especially platantheras and their mycorrhizal associates. So please welcome uh, Melissa McCormick, Dr. Melissa McCormick. <laughs> so I wanna first start out by saying that this was intended to be a joint talk between me and uh, my postdoc, Ida Hartvig. Ida is still in Denmark and she is not gonna be in the US until Friday. And so it would be two in the morning for her. And she thought she might not give the best talk at two in the morning. And, and I can understand that. Um, and her little kids might not appreciate it either. So um, I decided I would go ahead and present her work as well as mine. This is a joint project. It's been going on for a number of years now. And it, it actually started back in 2003, working with an intern who is now a faculty member uh, in a university of her own. And so in her own right, rather, I should say. And she also continues to do work on orchids. So we're spreading the goodwill. Um, but we started in 2003 looking at the mycorrhizal associations of Platanthera. And then when Ida joined me two years ago to conduct her postdoctoral research at CERC, she brought in a genomic component to looking at the plants, not just the fungi. And, and, and it turns out that that's really key to understanding what's going on. And so that's what I'm gonna tell you a little bit about today. This is an ongoing project. We just got 300 gigabytes of data last week. We have not processed it all yet, surprisingly enough. And this is also work that is um, part of Simone Evans' honors thesis at University of Maryland. Um, and so she's been working with me since she was a junior in high school. Uh, and working on this project for several years now, and she's getting ready to finish up and go off to graduate school. So it's very much a joint project, and I'm so pleased to be able to present what they're doing as well as what I've been doing. Okay, so first of all, just a brief introduction. Most of you probably know this, but the orchid family, the orchidaceae, is one of the largest, flowering, flower, largest families of flowering plants. There's an estimated 25,000 to 30,000 species. Um, it varies a lot depending on who you ask, particularly the grass people tend to think there are fewer orchid species and the orchid people tend to think there are more orchid species, but you know, it, it, it varies a little bit. Um, but for orchids, a major determinant of where they grow is where the fungi that they need to grow are available. Um, and which fungi are needed varies among species. And so that's where a lot of my research is focused. But, there's a lot of different things going on here. So most orchids are tropical. 
and that's what most people think about. Um, but orchids grow from the tropics to above the Arctic Circle and everywhere in between. And, and, and Doug is, is, in, is enjoying the photo of the pink lady slipper here. This was actually taken in Michigan, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but about 25% of, and you, and you can see here, I've got a different estimate of the number of orchid species. So it's depending on who you ask and when you ask them, the, the number of orchid species can vary anywhere from like 18,000, which up to 30,000. And it's probably somewhere between those. Um, but about a quarter of the, of the orchid species are terrestrial, such as we have here in Maryland. Um, and a lot of them are threatened or endangered. So for example, Maryland lists 51 native orchid species. Three of them are presumed, presumed extirpated in the state. Several others are listed as endangered. So it's very, very common in the orchid family. They tend to, they tend to be a lot of fairly rare species and as a result, many of them are threatened or endangered somewhere in their range. Of course, we have some beautiful, beautiful orchids native to our area. There are about 220 species of native orchids in the US and Canada. And as I said, 57% of them are threatened or endangered in some part of their range of distribution. So that's something that we're very concerned about from a conservation standpoint, but it also means that the orchids are kind of the jewels that we see only occasionally. So it means that they attract a lot of attention as well as being a, a subject of conservation concern. Now, where did all of these orchid species come from? There are so many of them. Well, it turns out that in orchids, one of the ways that you get a lot of new species is through hybridization. And that seems kind of counterintuitive, um, but I've got an example shown here where what can happen is you get species coming from here and species coming from here and they interbreed. And as a result, they form what would be a contemporary hybrid, we call it. But over time, those orchids, if they grow somewhere different, they can occupy different conditions, they maybe use different pollinators, they can then evolve into a new species that is now separated from either of the two parent species. And it turns out that in the orchid family, this is a fairly common method of the development of new species. So I looked at the evolution of new species um, and the role of hybridization and the role of fungal use in the speciation patterns of the most species rich genus of terrestrial orchids in North America, the genus Platanthera or the fringed orchids. And you can see some of the lovely examples that I've worked with here on the bottom. Um, and I will say that except for the actual hybrid orchids, which don't have a conservation status, there is only one of these that is considered to be um, stable and, and, and not of conservation concern in the state of Maryland. So they are, important from a conservation standpoint, but understanding what's going on is something that can really inform our conservation of these species. And we focused on two species complexes, um, with species complexes within two sections that include both contemporary hybrids, such as a couple of the examples that I've shown here, but also include species that are of proposed hybrid origin. So species that have been described they are thought to be new solid species, but yet they are thought to have originated from a hybridization event from two other species. And we tested the hypothesis that hybrids could be distinguished based on flower morphology, that the identity of the fungal associates, so which fungi can support these orchids, reflects how related, how related those orchids are phylogenetically, genetically, um, and that the identity of the mycorrhizal fungi differs among orchid species, as well as between hybrids and the parent species. And so these are important because they can tell us whether or not hybrids are able to grow under different conditions than their parents do, because that is so something of a prerequisite for the evolution of new species from a hybridization event. So the species that we worked with um, are shown here. We have Platanthera ciliaris, the orange fringed orchid, Platanthera blepher glottis, the white fringed bog orchid, Platanthera cristata, crested fringed orchid. Um, up at the top and 
for some reason, the edge of my slide is getting cut off, but that's okay, um, is Platanthera integralabia, which is a fringeless orchid. And then we also have a group in the purple complex that I call it. It's a section Fimbriella. It includes Platanthera grandiflora, Platanthera sicotes. For those people who are confident they can tell those apart, good for you. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I necessarily count myself among those, particularly since we have seen the whole range from one to the other, and it's a, it's a continuum. Um, and Platanthera ciliara, I'm mean, sorry, Platanthera lacera. Um, and within the orange complex here, we have the hybrid Platanthera bicolor, which is a hybrid of Platanthera blephrogaudus and ciliaris. We have Platanthera canbii, which is a hybrid of Cristata and blephrogaudus. Um, and then we have some Platanthera ex Reinhardii, which is a proposed hybrid between Integralabia and Ciliaris that sort of looks like a very, very pale, only slightly orange color. Um, there is also a proposed hybrid um, between Platanthera Ciliaris and Cristata. I'm not confident that we've ever seen it. Within the purples, we also have Platanthera ex Kenani, which is a hybrid between Lacera and Grandiflora, and Platanthera andrusii, which is a hybrid between Cicotes and Lacera. Now, in each of these complexes, we then have a species of proposed hybrid origin. Here we have Platanthera chapmanii, which is supposed to have been an ancient hybrid between Ciliaris and Cristata. And over here in the purples, we have Platanthera shriveri, which is supposed to have been an old ancient hybrid between Grandiflora and Lacera that is supposed to be distinct from Platanthera kenani, the contemporary hybrid. Yes, Doug? Okay, so the question was uh, whether there's any known hybrid between Cicotes and Grandiflora. Um, and I think the issue is that it's very, very difficult to tell those two species apart. And so whether you're seeing a hybrid or whether you're seeing the natural variation is not entirely clear. Um, we have some genetic samples that hopefully are gonna answer that question for us, but it's in that 300 gigabytes of data that we got last week. So it's gonna be at least another month or so before we know the answer to that one. But we used a three-pronged approach to try to distinguish the species and the hybrids within these complexes. Um, and so we started out looking at floral morphology. So when you're out in the field and you're looking for something that might be a hybrid, how do you tell? Well, what you can do is you can look at the flowers. You can look at the shape of the flower. You can look at the fringing of the flower, all of the different characteristics of those flowers. And that's important, not only because that's how you identify them in the field, but also because it's important for um, determining pollinator interactions and whether species continue to interbreed. We also used genomic composition. So we looked at the genetics of these plants and we assigned genes that came from one parent versus the other. And we looked to see whether they co-occur within hybrids. Um, and we did this at tens of thousands of locations within the genome. And then we also looked at mycorrhizal association, as I mentioned earlier. We looked at whether or not mycorrhizal associations, whether, whether different species associated with different fungi and how that affected with what could support the hybrids. Um, and for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna focus on just the orange section because that is the section for which we got some genetic data very early on. Whereas the perp most of the data for the purples is still in the, in the parallel cluster at the Smithsonian. <laughs> so, for sampling the orange complex, we basically tried to get every one of the examples that we possibly could. You can see here's, here's that hybrid that I said can be a contemporary hybrid between Cristata and Ciliaris that I wasn't sure we'd ever seen, partly because I'm not sure we could distinguish it from Platanthera chapmanii, which is supposedly of, the, of an ancient origin of that same hybridization between those two parent species. So we got samples from all of these different things, all these different species and hybrids from Texas across to North Florida um, and up to Pennsylvania. You can see the color, different color and symbol indications 
show sort of approximately where we sampled. So we tried very hard to get as much of the range as we possibly could. And it took an awful lot of volunteers from an awful lot of different places, as well as a collaboration with the Atlanta Botanic Garden to be able to collect all of these samples. So for looking at the morphology of the flowers, we measured a whole bunch of different things. Now, I wanna say that our identification of hybrids in the field was predominantly based on color of the flower because we were not out there. We were out there with calipers, but <laughs> you can only get so precise with calipers in the field. The color is pretty easy to assess. So for each flower, we measured the width of the lip, the length of the lip, the lip length with fringe. So that's where does the fringe start? How much of the lip is fringed? Um, and then also the length of the spur, which is very important for where pollinia are deposited on pollinators. And so where orchid, whether orchids can cross or not, but also the width of the flower and then the width of the entire inflorescence. And we did this on two flowers per inflorescence from, I think we had about 150 plants that we did this on. And if you take all of those measurements and you use principal components analysis to sort of collapse them down into two dimensions and to try to summarize variation between species in a way that you can look at it, this is what you get. And so what you can see in this diagram here, we again have color coding and symbol coding, but there are some patterns that you can see. There are some, you know, the colors of the different species show up in different places. It does a pretty good job of telling the species apart. So we have here Platanthra ciliaris in orange, uh, Platanthra cristata in a sort of lighter orange, uh, Platanthra blepharoglottis in the white, and Integra labia in the gray. But when we look at the hybrids, you can see that some of them are intermediate. So for example, with Platanthra cambii, this is the hybrid between, let me make sure I'm pointing the right thing, cristata and blepharoglottis. Um, and these are the sort of green squares. And you can see they fall between those two species. You know, they're, they're, but there's some overlap, particularly some of them cluster with Platanthera cristata. Um, there are also, with Platanthera bicolor, we see something similar. So here, Platanthera ciliaris is one parent, Blepharoglottis is the other, and then the little yellow diamonds here are the Platanthera bi, the X bicolor, the, the hybrids. And you can see that a lot of those actually cluster with the ciliaris. Okay, so what those may be, those could be back crosses. So not just a straight ciliaris crossed with a blepharoglottis, but a ciliaris crossed with a blepharoglottis and then crossed again with a ciliaris. And so it may have more similarity to ciliaris parent, or there could be other things going on. And, and we'll come back to that. Um, the one other example we had of a hybrid, this Platanthera reinhardii, it appears no different from Platanthera ciliaris. So these are the pink asterisks here. You can see they're all sort of in, intermixed with the Platanthera ciliaris. None of the traits differed. None of them got anywhere, anywhere close to Integra labia. It has very, very pale flowers, but they're colored. So we're not entirely sure what's going on with that, but um, we'll get back to that in a second. If we look at any one of the floral traits that we measured, for example, the longest fringe, length of the longest fringe, or the length of the spur, you can see again that in general, the hybrids, here's bicolor, which is the hybrid between Blepharoglottis and ciliaris, it's intermediate. See the same thing with Canbii, which is the hybrid between Cristata and Blepharoglottis. Again, intermediate. That's nice, you know, it works out very nicely. But then you have some things where you look at the length of the longest fringe, say in ciliaris, look at that range. So as a group, they differ. But if you're looking at any one individual plant, you're not gonna be able to do one measurement and tell you for certain whether you have a good species or whether you have a hybrid. And you may not even be able to tell the species apart. I mean, the length of the longest fringe and this, the only thing that's different is Integra labria that has no fringe. <laughs> and you see the same thing with spur length. 
look at look at the, look at the distance of the, the or sorry the range of spur lengths for Platanthera blepharoglottis. Now I want to point out also though that blepharoglottis is a species that has been divided into two varieties. One of which is more northern, one of which is more southern. They are variety conspicua and variety blepharoglottis. We have lumped them here, and there's a reason for that, and that is that if you were to look at variation in spur length, and so this is showing you the spur length, all these points color-coded for the species with latitude. Um, and what you see is that gray line up top that has a strong slope to it with latitude is Platanthera blepharoglottis. And what you see is not a long spur in one place and a short spur in the other. No, you see a continuum. And indeed, that's what we've seen when we looked at these measurements, either even within a single population often. And so that suggests that, yeah, we're not so sure that, that calling these two distinct varieties is all that well supported. But again, we're gonna be looking at the genetic data to see the extent to which that's supported. And there are a lot of the different characteristics that differ latitudinally. Why? Is it that there are better conditions for growing in the South and everything's bigger in the South. I mean, I, came, I, I spent some time in Texas. They'd be happy to tell you everything's bigger in Texas. <laughs> um, is it an adaptation to different pollinator fa faunas? Is it, is it that in order to get effect effectively pollinated, they're using different pollinators north and south? Maybe they need to have different, kinds, different shape or different uh, dimensions to their flowers. And we do not know the answer to that and we probably won't but it's a question for potential future research. Okay, so back up for just one second here. There's a lot of variation going on here. If you look at the spread of points on any one of these locations, it's big. Look at all that variation. What the heck is causing that? And that's particularly true for the Platanthera ciliaris. Remember that was the one that had the huge variation in, in fringe length it's also got these big spread. I mean, this is fairly compact here. Look at how much, how much spread there is in ciliaris. So we turned to our genetic data to look for that. And as I said, we've used, we used three rad sequencing, which is basically looking at tens of thousands of locations throughout the genome. And it basically just goes and it says, if we look at the different species, what does this species look like at this location? What does this species look like at this location? How different are they? Are there some variations at each location that are characteristic of one species or another species? And then it says, if you have this variation here, this must belong to this species. If you have this variation here, it must belong to this other species. And it does this at, you know, throughout the genome. And what we get is something that looks like this. And, and this is a structure diagram. And, it's a little complicated to look, like, look at, but if you sort of boil it down, in blue here are all of those variation, genetic variations that are predominant in Platanthera blepharoglottis, the white fringe bog orchid. And you can see that all of these individuals that we identified as Platanthera blepharoglottis, with just a couple of exceptions here, are pretty solid blue. They pretty much just have their own DNA. Uh, and if we look at the hybrids, you can see that those that we identified as Platanthera canbii, which is a hybrid between Blepharoglottis in blue and Cristata in orange, they're pretty nicely mixed. Same thing with the bicolor, by and large, a couple of exceptions here, but they have, this is a hybrid between Blepharoglottis in blue and Ciliaris in green. Okay, that's lovely. But, but, but look at ciliaris. All these that we identified as ciliaris on the field that are all mixed. They have blepharoglottis DNA in them. A lot of them have some crustata DNA in them. And the only block that we have right here, that's the solid green, that's the only place that ciliaris doesn't co-occur with one of the other two species. <laughs> it's actually, there's, there's more than one place in there, but, but yes. Yeah. So, the only time you have pure ciliaris DNA is 
if you have a ciliaris in a location, it doesn't co-occur with one of these other fringed orchids. So that told us that, okay, remember all that overlap in the morphological characteristics and the, morph the morphological measurements of the flowers between ciliaris and the hybrids? Look how similar some of these things that we identified as ciliaris are to the hybrids. Um, and so it, it this seems to indicate that there's a pretty strong genetic signal that we're picking up in this morphological variation that we were using predominantly flower color to distinguish hybrids in the field. These look like nice, perfectly nice orange flowers that look pretty similar to all the other ciliaris flowers. And I suspect that the reason that, that the blepharoglottis are so clean is that orange trumps white, no matter what. So if you have a nice clean white flower, it's a pretty solid blepharoglottis. But if you have any ciliaris DNA in there or any cristata DNA in there, it starts to become orangey. And then we identify it as a hybrid. Whereas orange could probably hide an awful lot of, of the white. So you can get a pretty nice orange flower, even if you've got a significant amount of DNA coming from that blepharic lattice. So this told us we needed to do some thinking <laughs> about what we were calling ciliaris if we were trying to distinguish these species. Do we really want to consider these as pure ciliaris or do we want to recognize that they're hybrids? So we said, all right, um, we've got all this genetic variation. Uh, let's use that. Um, and let's use that to interpret the types of fungi that orchids need. And oh, I didn't realize we had that. So just a little bit on the association of orchids and mycorrhizal fungi. For those people who are not familiar with it, um, orchids depend on other species to grow. Obviously they depend on pollinators, so do pretty much all other plants. They depend on fungi, so do pretty much all other plants. Um, but orchids kind of take that to an extreme. And so I wanna make clear why it is that the fungi are so important to, to orchid biology. So I think most of you probably know, but just as a, as a refresher, most plants associate with fungi. They form an association with fungi in their roots called a mycorrhiza. Myco meaning fungus, rhiza meaning root. And a mycorrhiza is a symbiotic association between a plant root and a fungus. And they characterize most plants in most ecosystems. All plant families have at least somebody, and, and in most cases, pretty much everybody that associates with mycorrhizal fungi. They are important for access to nutrients, water, and for pathogen protection. And some plants are especially strongly dependent on mycorrhizae. So most of what you have in your garden probably isn't. Most of what you see in the woods, most of what you see in the prairies probably is. Uh, there are lots of different flavors of mycorrhizal associations and they differ in terms of what fungi they're involved, they differ in how they look. An awful lot of trees have ectomycorrhizal associations that kind of make their roots look like that. And no, that's not a disease, that's a perfectly functional root. Most herbaceous plants and also some trees use arbuscular mycorrhizae. This is a very closely defined group of fungi that form these types of associations. They grow into the root cells, um, form these little coils called arbuscules. And they have a, both of these have a very nice two-way exchange of nutrients, or at least that's the happy story we tell. We all know that it's a continuum between parasitism one direction and parasitism in the other. But fundamentally, the trees or the plants, um, they get nutrients from the fungi, whether it be nitrogen, whether it be phosphorus, they often get water from them. And in exchange, the carbon, some of the carbon that the plant fixes through photosynthesis gets to the fungus to support it. So the fungi tend to be limited by the amount of carbon they have. The plants tend to be limited by the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus. Now for orchids, if you look at this diagram here, it looks superficially pretty much like this, right? Um, but it uses very, very different fungi. This is what it would look like in the orchid cell. So this is a piece of orchid root. Um, if you could see it, you would see that there are just barely an outline of a root cell here and it is packed full of fungus. And that is orchid snack, orchid dinner. Um, and up there at the top is a baby orchid. You can see the little shoot coming out and you can see the fungi all around the outside of it. 
And that's a happy orchid. That's the way it wants to be. And it wouldn't get that way without the fungi. So this nice two-way exchange that I told you about for most of the mycorrhizal associations, well, orchids don't do that. <laughs> Orchids take mycorrhizae to an extreme. They cheat their mycorrhizal fungi. They eat them. They are entirely dependent on their fungi for all of their nutrition, at least early in life. And this light early life stage may last only a few months or it may last many years. And during this time, as I said, they're entirely dependent on fungi. And it turns out that it's this extreme dependence on fungi that's really important for understanding why orchids are the way they are. And this also sort of offers a bit of an insight into mystery that Darwin had with orchids. So Darwin was fascinated by orchids' elaborate pollination mechanisms and why it is that plants that produce so many seeds are so often rare. And he thought about that and he said, well, the, it's not the pollination that determines how many seeds there are. He calculated that if all of the seeds grew into plants, then the great-grandchildren of a single orchid would cover the earth in one continuous green carpet. And I love that quote, because if you just imagine the earth covered in orchids and you imagine how far, it, how far these rare orchid, these rare plants are from covering the earth in a continuous green carpet, you know there has to be something going on that's keeping them from being as abundant as they potentially could be. And that something is their need for specific fungi. So, Orchid seeds have little or no nutrients in them. They are tiny. Um, a capsule up there has maybe 100,000 or more seeds in it. And that dust that you see on the gray, gray to black background there, that's the seeds. They're very, very tiny, they're dust seeds. And their germination requires specific fungi because they don't have any food in their seeds. They have, somebody has to feed them. And that somebody is fungi. And, and the orchids actually digest their fungi. So they are able to produce chemicals that lyse the fungal hyphae, and then they're able to absorb the nutrients from that lysed hyphae. Um, and during this early life stage, you can see here, it looks like a grain of rice that is actually a baby orchid. And then in that circle, the little tiny dots, the little things around them, those are the ungerminated seeds. Those are germinated seeds called protocorms. Eventually those protocorms will begin to green up start to photosynthesize, then they can produce some of their own food. And eventually they'll produce a leaf for a seedling. And you might think, okay, they're now independent. Do you notice something missing on this seedling? It has a leaf, where's the root? Um, and unlike most plants, orchids will produce the shoot before they produce a root. Um, and the, way, the reason they're able to do that is the fungi that are feeding that protocorm and that seedling function as the roots for them. So it's clear that they're doing something very different. And it turns out that if, you, if your germination of your seeds is limited to only those places where you find just the right fungus, not very many of your seeds germinate. And suddenly you go from covering the earth in one continuous green carpet to just an occasional one here or there that manages to grow. Yes, Doug. Uh, where do the so the question was, where do the orchids, uh, where do the orchid protocorms get their chloroplasts, and whether there are orchid, whether there are chloroplasts in the seed? And I assume that there must be. Um, we do have a couple more questions on the chat. I figured Go now is a good time. Yep. Uh, first question is, uh, what percentage of orchids um, that this that you see in natural areas are hybrid individuals? I would say that for most orchids, it's very very few. Um, we looked long and hard to try and find those locations where we could find hybrid individuals. And if you were to look on Facebook, you would see that um, there are scattered locations throughout the country, but they're not common. And it's, it's, there's a few places, and it, but it is generally quite rare. And, and some genera, it's much more common than others. Okay, and then um, we got another question as well. Um, do all orchids use arbuscular mycorrhizae? No orchids use arbuscular mycorrhizae. All orchids use orchid mycorrhizal fungi. Um, and I'm about to get to what those fungi are, but they are a very distinct group of fungi from the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. Yeah, Karen. Uh, 
So the question is, do the nutrients that are provided by the fungi, is that what triggers germination or whether there is something else that triggers germination? And I don't think we know the answer to that. Um, we know that the um, forming an association with fungi, I, I imagine that the nutrients must play at least some role, but also the moisture that they bring, the water that they bring also is a trigger. So you'll see just like most plants, orchid seeds will imbibe with water before they start to develop but the embryo in an orchid seed is undifferentiated. So it will start out undifferentiated. And then once the fungus comes in, only then, no, you know what? Now that I think about it, I think there are cases for both. And, and the reason I say that is because some orchids can be very easily germinated in the lab under sterile conditions on a nutrient rich medium. Other orchids cannot. And we haven't, in, there are some species that we just can't figure out a way to germinate in the lab or it takes some special co special combination of, of conditions. So I think it's probably both. So if you have a, an orchid seed, um, the fungi then can grow into particular cells of the orchid embryo and in the rest of the orchid embryo and in the developing protocorm, orchids actually produce a fungicide that limits where the fungus can be and what cell the fun cells the fungus can be in. And this association with fungi um, continues into the adult stage of orchids. So while some orchids can grow without fungi, and certainly the ones that you get from, um, from your local grocery store or, or hardware store generally will not have fungi with them. It isn't because they wouldn't normally have fungi as a plant in, the, in nature, they would. And it turns out that if you look at the roots of any native orchid, you would look into that root and you look into a microscope and you would find these balls of fungus inside those root cells. And the orchid will continue to digest those fungi in order to get nutrients it needs all through adulthood. And it turns out that, that associating with these fungi is super important for helping plants to tolerate stress. And so if you get an orchid that gets shaded, if you get an orchid that is exposed to drought, it'll go back to living off of its fungi. It'll quit photosynthesizing and go back to living off of its fungi. And the same thing happens when there are an awful lot of orchids, and I know Doug will tell you this, that can die back below ground and just not produce a shoot above ground for years at a time, decades at a time. And during that time, they are living off their fungi. So of course this means that if we, have to, if we want to conserve orchids, if we're interested in why orchids grow where they do, we need to know what fungi they need. So what we do is we go out and we find our little orchid plant and we look down at the base and we find there is one fat little orchid root right there. And we can take just that one root and cover the plant back up carefully and take that root back to the lab and under sterile conditions, under a microscope, we can dissect out those little balls of fungus from inside the root cells and we can grow them up. And then we can extract DNA from this fungus that's grown out, sequence that DNA and figure out what we've got. And the reason we have to use the DNA to do that is it turns out that orchids mostly mostly form associations with just two different genera of fungi. And while if you have very, very different fungi, you can tell them apart just by looking at them. But if you have fungi within the same genus, they may be functionally very, very different, but yet you cannot tell them apart from looking at them. So if we look at what orchid mycorrhizal fungi look like, this is about as impressive as they get. Okay, there's no nice little mushroom to look at. We are talking smear of jelly on wood that may or may not become entirely invisible once it dries. Not very helpful for being able to identify things. Even microscopically, you cannot tell these things apart. That's why we use DNA sequencing to do it. <clears throat> but it turns out that the most common genera of orchid mycorrhizal fungi, at the genus level anyway, are widespread and really pretty common. But they're very poorly studied. Um, in particular, the genus Telesnella, which is what I've shown two examples of here. And the reason they're very poorly studied is, of course, partly because they're morphologically indistinguishable and they're just not much to look at. Um, but also because a lot of the way people are studying fungi now is they're using general fungus primers to look using DNA sequencing 
at what fungi are there. And those general fungus primers don't work for this genus at all. And so they're not getting picked up in any of the biodiversity surveys that are being done. Um, I'm looking to try and rectify that as a result of a couple of grants that I have going on. Yeah, so yeah, Fertilla asnella. So Fertilla asnella, the, the, for Ceratobacidium, the, the primers work. Um, we still don't know a lot about the particular Ceratobacidiums that are associated with orchids though. But even within either Tilesnella or within Ceratobacidium, there are ecologically very, very diverse. And I seem to get rid of, well, I don't know how to get rid of that. We'll just put that there. Okay, so ecologically, they're extremely diverse. They might also, while they're forming orchid mycorrhizae with orchids, they might also be forming ectomycorrhizae, or they might also be parasitizing other fungi, or they might also be, par be, be, be pathogens of other plants or they might be decomposers. There are all kinds of things that these fungi are doing other than supporting orchids, and we really know virtually nothing about them. <clears throat> so as I said, if you have fungi that look very, very different, such as these fungi here, this is a Ceratobacidium, this is a Telasnella, this is a different Telasnella that happens to be distantly related to this one, this is a tomentella, it's a different group of fungi altogether. Those you can tell apart by looking at them, but what you can't tell is within each of those groups. So it turns out that within the fungi that we are interested in, in association with our different Platanthera species, you can't tell them apart by looking at them. And so we had to use DNA sequencing to do that. And what we did was to sequence the internal transcribed spacer of the nuclear ribosomal repeat. And that's just a long way of saying ITS it is the barcoding locus for fungi. So it is the portion, portion of DNA that is generally used to identify fungi. That just means we have a big database we can refer to. It's generally variable among species and generally not variable within species, um, but species definitions in fungi are kind of questionable to begin with. So that's pretty much the best we can do in terms of distinguishing things. And what we can do is to use that sequences of that particular region say how closely related are these fungi? How similar are they? And how does that relate to what orchid species they associate with? And for the orange complex, well, we get a couple of big trees that I know you cannot see. <laughs> I promise we're gonna do it a little, look at it a little bit differently. So what I've got here is um, you can see, first of all, that the vast majority of the fungi that we have from the orange group are in this tree over here to the far right, the tree, the Tulesnella tree. The Ceratobacidium tree is much, much smaller. Orchids in this group seem to predominantly associate with fungi in the genus Tulesnella. I have the sequences color coded. So the green sequences here belong to, came from Platanthera blepharoglottis. The orange sequences came from Platanthera ciliaris. And the dark red ones came from Platanthera cristata. And you can see there's a lot of intermixing but there's maybe some patterns. Um, but the other thing I wanna point out is that where we've identified Platanthera cristata and Platanthera ciliaris on this tree is just based on our field identification. And remember, there's a lot of genetic variation going on there and some mixing of genes. And so we wanted to try and make sense out of this. And so what we did was to look at it a little bit differently. Now this still looks complicated, but it's not as bad as it was. <laughs> um, so what we can see is that the fungi used by individual orchids reflect their genetic makeup. And so what I've got here in this box is all of those orchids that have some blepharoglottis DNA. So in the center here, we've got blepharoglottis and you can see that it predominantly uses this yellow fungus, this sort of goldenrod fungus and, and maybe this little orange one here. And what you can see is that if you have bicolor, so the hybrid between Blepharoglottis and Ciliaris, it's got a lot of those fungi too. Um, and if we go with look at Cambii, which is the hybrid between Blepharoglottis and Cristata, it's also got those fungi. And we don't see those yellow fungi anywhere else where, where, we, don't have, where we don't have Blepharoglottis DNA. Ciliaris here are, that I say is mixed in parentheses, those are orchids that we identified as Ciliaris in the field but when we looked at the genetic composition, they had a lot of blepharoglottis DNA. So we can see that these yellow fungi here, yellow and goldenrod and orange, those are predominantly fungi associated with blepharoglottis. 
but there's other things going on. There's an awful lot of colors on this graph. Let's look about this one here. So Latanthria integral labia is super specific. It only uses one fungus. But wait, what's this thing over here? Well, those are the ciliaris that are mixed and had some, they were thought to be Reinhardii. So morphologically, their flowers just look like pale ciliaris flowers, but we thought they were Reinhardii. And we're still waiting on the genetic information to tell us whether there is integralabia DNA in those plants. But it is going to be very interesting to see. So, okay, so that's, what, that's pretty much what I wanted to say here. So there are some interesting patterns. There's a lot of diversity in these fungi that we don't really understand. But there's a lot of sharing of fungi associated with genetic composition. Yeah, Doug. So I'm counting six. It's pretty much what you see for ciliaris. Yeah, yeah. So I, the question was, uh, we sorry. have an, a maximum of 16 species of fungi in one area and one another. And what's the, what's the maximum number that she's found? Um, but you can also see the, for example, the Canbii here. It shares some fungi with Cristata. And, and it is a hybrid of Cristata and Blepharoglottis. So you can see that it uses fungi associated with both parents. And that was really one of the things we wanted to see because that means that the hybrids can grow anywhere either of the parents can grow. And there's also the potential, and we didn't test for this specifically, but there's the potential that they could also be using fungi that neither of the parents used. So for example, Yeah, that, that purpley pink color right there, or this it's pale, it's pale green ones there, but, but yeah, so there's also the potential for that. And if they can use fungi that neither parent can use, that means they could potentially grow in locations that neither parent could grow. And that's what we need to be able to get a hybrid, a species of hybrid origin to evolve. <clears throat> so we went in and we said, all right, well, first of all, we wanna know, do the hybrids prefer, which is to say, have higher germination rates with fungi from their maternal parent than from their paternal parent? Does it matter who, which one's mom? Does it matter whether you go Blepharoglottis to Cristata or Cristata to Blepharoglottis? Um, and this is kind of important because it tells you where the seeds can grow because they tend to stay close to mom. And so a lot, in a lot of species, there's a maternal component to things like symbiotic associations. So what we did was to say, all right, well, we, we want to make sure we actually have hybrids. Um, and so we went out and we did hand pollinations. And that's what um, Simone and Thomas are doing right here. Um, and you can see an, a resulting inflorescence. And this is Ida right here, hand pollinating this one. And you can see the little colored strings that we have here tied around the individual flowers that we hand pollinated. And that is how we identified what they were. And we came back after the seeds had matured and we were able to collect them. And we did all of these different crosses between Cristata and Ciliaris, as well as between Blepharoglottis and Ciliaris and Blepharoglottis and Cristata, both directions. And then we tried to grow them with fungi from different parents. Now, first of all, we wanted to know whether these crosses actually worked. Did they even produce viable seeds? Well, yes, yes. In, in fact, all of them produced some amount of viable seed. Um, and there are a couple of patterns that you can see. So I've got some separated off into sections. These are all things that had Blepharoglottis as the maternal parent. And what you can see is that, yeah, it worked with all the different crosses, whether it's Blepharoglottis by Blepharoglottis, Blepharoglottis by Ciliaris, Blepharoglottis by Cristata, open pollinated. Um, these are all of the Ciliaris maternal parent, and these are all the Cristata maternal parent, and this is a naturally occurring um, Platanthera bicolor. So the hybrid wanted to make sure that, yeah, it would set seed if we just left it alone. And indeed it does. Um, but there's a couple things you can see on this. You can see that, yep, bicolor has got pretty good germination rates. It's fertile. Um, okay, yes. So one of the things we also noticed is that Blepharoglottis is a crappy dad. <laughs> um, so everything that's got Blepharoglottis as a paternal parent, uh, there's my mouse back, has pretty low germination, in some cases, very low germination. Um, and 
we noticed that Cristata had fairly low germination in most combinations, um, except that everything with ciliaris had good germination rates, whether it's the paternal parent, whether it's the maternal parent, it produced lots of viable seeds. Um, now the higher germination rates for the hybrids than for the open pollinated seeds could be an artifact. And I don't wanna make anything strongly of that um, because there's a low rep number in the open pollinated plant and the open pollinated seed capsules. And some of them were collected a different year. So there could have been a weather effect as well. So I don't wanna make anything of that, but the ciliaris has this really high germination is, is pretty amazing in this. But nevertheless, they did all produce some viable seeds. So then we went and we said, all right, do the hybrids prefer fungi from their mother than from their dad? So we went out and we had um, looked at germination rates of these seeds that we produced and brought back to the lab. And we said, we're gonna grow these all with three fungi from each of their parents, plus asymbiotic media. And so this black medium here, it includes carbon, but it also includes um, all of the nutrients that the orchids need to grow. And what we found was that we can get some germination without the fungi, but we get much better germination if the fungi are there. Um, so you can see one little, one little orchid seedling here on, on the black medium, but there's a lot of germination here on these, these with these other groups of fungi. Yeah. Do you know whether, uh, so the question was, do the plants grown on the, on the asymbiotic medium without fungi, do they become more and more able to grow without fungi? And the answer to that is no. Um, and so they'll grow on this nutrient rich medium, but if you wanna have high survival, you want them to have gotten the right fungi at some point to be able to do that going forward. So we just um, had a paper accepted. I don't think it's out in print yet, um, but where we grew plants in the greenhouse with or without fungi, and then we transplanted them out into garden beds. And basically the, the ones with fungi had better survival and better, better growth. <clears throat> okay, so we went and we looked at these different fungi and we said, do they prefer mom's fungus over dad's fungus? And the answer is it doesn't make a darn bit of difference to them. <laughs> so in this graph here, we've got the different combinations and we have the mom fungus and the dad fungus, mom fungus, dad fungus, the various combinations. You can see again, the huge differences between the different types of crosses in terms of how viable the seeds were but there was no difference within each of those. There's no difference between the mom fungus and the dad fungus. There's maybe a suggestion here. You'll see there are no error bars on here. Um, so we're still trying to figure out exactly what the correct analysis is to do, but clearly there's not a significant effect. So what this shows us then is that the hybrid seeds can, the seedlings, the plants, they can use different fungi. I mean, we knew that, we saw, that's what we saw in the field, right? But we had thought there might be some preference in the lab in terms of who they could grow with and we're just not seeing it. And so that just tells us that the hybrids are sort of generalists. They can use a lot of different things. And the germination rates do vary with different fungal strains um, and we're still doing a more detailed analysis to figure out why this strain might be better than that one. And we don't know the answer to that yet. So what does this mean for conservation and management? Well. Species delimitation is difficult. And as anybody who's tried to sell, who's tried to tell Platanthera grandiflora and Platanthera sicodies apart can tell you, this is not easy, but it's made even more difficult like in a case like this, where we have plants that we're identifying as Platanthera ciliaris, but some of them are hybrids. A lot of them are hybrids. Um, and is that something to be concerned about? Well, some conservationists are. Um, our feeling is hybridization is a natural process. It's linked to speciation. So it's not necessarily a conservation concern. I mean, it could become a conservation concern if we have a case where one species is incredibly rare and maybe as a result of human activities or a result of global change, the other species is moving in and you're gonna lose everything that was distinctively that one species. That could be a conservation concern, but I think in general, it's not. We do think though that protection levels should extend to all of the intermediate varieties. You remember I said on that first, one of the early slides, it's like, all of these species that are species are rare, threatened or endangered in Maryland. And then there's the hybrids and they have no status. So they still carry the genetic information of the parent species. And of course, as I said, we're presuming, 
we're trying to preserve evolutionary processes here that can evolve into new species. But the conservation genomics of Platanthera can tell us a lot about inbreeding and gene flow among natural populations and can identify populations that might be a special conservation concern. If there are very distinctive genotypes in one population, we want to make, may want to make sure that one gets saved. This is one of many projects that we have as part of the North American Orchid Conservation Center. Um, the mission for the North American Orchid Conservation Center, or NAOC, is to conserve our native orchid heritage. And we do this through preservation of orchids, preservation of orchid seeds and fungi in our collections at CERC, learning how to propagate the orchids, but also educating people about what orchids we have. This is a huge interactive group of people. We have a lot of different organizations that are involved throughout the United States and Canada. And we're developing products like the Go Orchids website. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, I encourage you to go have a look. It's, um, you can find it at goorchids.northamericanorchidcenter.org. You can see that you could do, you could go onto this site, for example, if you had something, you were out in the field, you said, <laughs> I, I think this is an orchid, but I'm not sure. And you can go and you can look and you can say, oh, well, what do I have? Um, I've got leaves. Okay, can I tell something about leaf arrangement? Can I tell it what, you can start out by telling it what state you're in. I have, this one is set to Maryland. So these are the, it has 52 matching results. Remember I said there were 51 native orchids in Maryland. One of these, one of the ones that's on here is not native. So that's the 52. Um, and you can say, well, what do I have? Do I have flowers? Yes. Well, then you can get the flower pictures. Do I have leaves? Well, do I have leaves, not flowers? Well, you can make it show leaf pictures instead. And you can say, well, what information do I have? And it'll narrow it down as you tell it what information you have to what the different possibilities are. And if you find what you think is the right orchid, then you can go to the species page. And in this case, I've chosen Calipogon tuberosus. And you can look at the different pictures. You can see what it looks like if it's very, very little, for example. I would not wanna try and distinguish species based on that stage. Um, but you can look at habitat, you can look at, find out where it grows. You can find out if we know the pollinators, the pollinators are listed there. And you can go down and you can look and say, what's its distribution in North America? And you can also look at it and say, okay, I'm in Maryland, how rare is it? Does it have any kind of state status? And you can look down and say, well, it's globally secure, um, but it's highly state rare. I think I know of about one location in Maryland where it grows. <laughs> so there's a lot of information there that people can get to know. We've also developed orchid gami. These are our paper punch out models. And there are 24 different models that are currently available. I think we have two more that are currently at the printers. All of them are available as free PDFs at the North American Orchid Center.org forward slash orchid gami. They're also, they're all free available as PDFs, but then you have to cut it all out. So we have them available as punch out models. Um, we have two different packets of 10 models, each, no, five models each that can be purchased for $10 a piece. And you can get that by emailing me, emailing Dennis, and I'll put my email up here in a second. Um, and then we are also working on, we have a contract with Tuttle Publishers to put together an Orchid Gami Orchids book that has 20 of the um, models in it, all in the nice paper punch outs. And that we are hoping, hoping, hoping will be available soon. <laughs> um, it's getting there. Uh, and we're also working on, I think right now we're looking at like for next year is the book version of the North American orchids that goes with as a companion guide to the Go Orchids website. And I think we're, we're closing in on, now they're saying maybe, maybe June. <laughs> I'm not sure on that one. Um, but NAOC is, is sort of a work in progress, just like the Platanthera work that I presented today. We're making a lot of progress though. Of course, it all depends on long-term success depends on development of a sustainable funding base. Always something we're working on. If anybody knows anybody with deep pockets who loves orchids, we'd love to hear about it. Um, but the NAOC model is based on ecological concepts and citizen science. And it's a model that seems to gain a lot of traction. So it's, it's, it's attracting an ever increasing number of collaborators, but it's also branching out internationally. So there's a group from Europe that has, that has reached out to us and is establishing a, a European version of NAOC. 
It's also one that we have reached out to Palau with. And so this is some work that we've been doing in Palau, working on the native orchids in Palau and incorporating the various native groups in the research that we do, as well as uh, conservation of these species. And in the future, Ida is of course done with her postdoc with me, but she has received additional funding to do some work on orchid hologenomics. So that's not just thinking about the orchid and the fungus, it's thinking about the orchid and the mycorrhizal fungus and the other fungi that are living in the leaves and in the roots and the endophytes and the bacteria that are living there as well and finding out how they all work together. Um, and so that's, that's part of sort of the next steps for this project. There are lots and lots of different people to thank for the Potanthera portion of this project. Um, I did mention this was with Ida and with Simone. There were also various other people that contributed to this. Ida's postdoc was funded by the Carlsberg Foundation and there was funding from the American Orchid Society, from the Maryland Native Plant Society, as well as the Washington Biologist Field Club and from NAOC. And of course, there's lots and lots and lots of people who have contributed to NAOC. And I promised you that I would put my email up there if anybody is interested in um, purchasing any of the packets, if you're interested in getting on the, or the Orchidgami packets, if anybody's interested in getting on the mailing list for the NAOC newsletter, which is just, I think, four times a year. Um, so it's not that, not a, lot, not, not a lot of email, but if you're interested, that's something that you can send me an email about. And I think I can take a couple minutes for questions. First question from Kay Frost. Are you seeing different numbers of genes in the hybrids compared to the parents? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by numbers of genes. And the reason I say that is, so the, the regions that we are amplifying throughout the genome are not associated with particular genes. Although we can identify those regions that characterize one species or another, and then map them back to the genome and find out what genes they're close to. But we're not looking specifically at the number of genes. The only things that we are looking at are particular regions that are present in all of our different species. So we first narrow it down to that. And then if there are additional genes in one species, we would not be picking that up using this method. Okay, um, Mark Imlay. Uh, is asking um, if you can name a habitat in Maryland that needs protection because of orcas of concern, threatened or endangered. What is the name of the park or kind of other type of habitat? There's a lot of them. <laughs> um, give, give us a few examples. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's there are some really outstanding habitats in and near uh, the Catoctin State Park area, or the State Park, National Park, National Park, National Park. Uh, in, the, in the Catoctin National Park area, there are places also on the Eastern shore that are Nature Conservancy properties and are not open to the public. So they are fairly well protected in some cases, and in other cases not. Um, I mean, there's a lot of places in Western Maryland and, and there's a lot of places in Western Maryland that have suffered huge losses of orchids, like 95% plus decreases in orchid abundance in the last 40 years um, that is likely tied to deer abundance. So yeah, I don't, I don't, do you have, you have favorite areas to list, Doug? So Doug is saying that most likely most of those areas are pretty well known to the Maryland Native Plant Society because uh, you guys take field trips there a lot. Yeah, I mean, there are some really nice areas on the Eastern shore that are sort of little, I mean, if, if it were a shopping center, I'd call it a little hole in the wall place, but you know, you know, a little place that maybe doesn't seem like much at the outset when you go and look and see what species are there are pretty amazing. But I mean, not all of them, are, some of them are roadsides for heaven's sake. Next question from Fawn. Can you distinguish the hybrid gene or genes that give hybrids the ability to use maternal, paternal, and also new fungi species? Uh, in other words, is there like an adaptability gene sequence? So we don't know that yet, but I have another postdoc working on exactly that. Um, and we are 
sending off fungal genomes for sequencing. We're sending off orchid genomes for sequencing, as well as looking at the genes that are expressed in establishment of a successful mycorrhizal association. So we're hoping to get some idea of what genes those are, but we don't know that yet. It's, it's sort of the holy grail of mycorrhizal associations. And, and people have been trying to do that for many, many years with our buscular mycorrhizal associations and ectomycorrhizal associations and are just starting to get some traction on those. And then kind of a follow-up there, um, could, if you find one of those kind of adaptability gene sequences, could that be used to give other plants adaptability in the face of uh, challenges related to climate change? I don't know. <laughs> Something I mean, to explore, I, mean, I guess. Yeah, I, it, it is. I mean, I'm, I'm not a super big fan of, I mean, CRISPR would be the way to do it, but I, I'm not a super big fan of, of applying CRISPR to um, native species. I think in a lot of cases, the native species have the ability to adapt somewhere in their genomes, um, but certainly hybridization in orchids and, and in a lot of other species is a way that is sort of naturally moving those genes around and, and uh, allowing species to adapt perhaps more than they otherwise could. Uh, question from Suzanne Lee. Um, could you identify the area of Pennsylvania where you've been working? No, I can't because I'm not allowed to for permit reasons. Okay. <laughs> um, and then another one from Kay Frost. Um, do epiphytic orchids also rely on mycorrhizae fungi? Yes, uh, they do. Sorry. And are there any epiphytic ones in North America? There are epiphytic orchids in South Florida. And in fact, there are some that make it into southernmost Georgia. No, actually they make it into North Carolina. There's one species that makes it up into North Carolina. And yes, they do use mycorrhizal fungi. And um, those fungi can determine what orchids can grow on a particular tree, depending on what fungus or fungi, what fungi are there. Um, and what was I gonna say? I mean, orchid, epiphytic orchids tend to green up a lot faster. So they become photosynthetic a lot faster, but they're also in a habitat that becomes periodically extremely dry because it's exposed to the air. And so they have to be able to have something that allows them to tolerate that drought and still be able to get nutrients that they're getting from the bits and bits and pieces of, of organic material that's accumulating in the bark. Well, I, I think everybody wants to thank um, Melissa for her presentation. We have people clapping in the room and I see some hand waves uh, across our audience. Uh, thank you uh, everyone for, for joining in this evening.